Hey, I am Professor Tom W. Bell. We're on my website here. If you want to know more about who I am, where I'm coming from, I'll just show you that. You can go look at TomWBell.com. Uh, by the way, those of you, since we're among friends of liberty here, those of you who have really sharp eyes, if you look very closely at this uh, little self-portrait here, I did this as some kind of self-portrait, you'll notice this is Ayn Rand right here off of my right ear. And my own book is down here. I got some other friends' books in here and some other stuff. But um, <laughs> I thought some of you would like that. Um, so I want to tell you about my book, Your Next Government. I don't want to give you the whole presentation here, of course. We don't have time for that. I want to let you know about the book, of course. There it is. There's the name of it, Your Next Government. And uh, if you go to Amazon, you can get a copy. And the copy here is recent as of, you know, when I handed it over. It actually has a 2018 um, date of publication, but I basically put it to press October 12, 2017. Now, recently, because of a generous donor, I was able to do an audiobook version. Here it is on Amazon. It's an audible to. I'm going to put it on some other platforms. So this is the new audiobook version. This just came out like, wow, I think it was this week. And I'm kind of excited about it. I've never done an audiobook before. And I did do the reading myself. Um, and I think it turned out okay. Uh, who knows? But the thing that I want to tell you about here today is that it's got this update. There's a new update. And by the way, if you get the audiobook, which I encourage you to do, of course, you can come to this page. I say this in the audiobook, but you can come to this page and you can see the figures. So I'll just click on a figure here and, you know, there you go. Because in an audiobook, you can't see figures, but I wanted to share that. Okay, so there's a new version of my audiobook out, and um, what I want to do is give you all what I gave people in the audiobook, and that is a special postscript update. Because in the original book, Your Next Government, um, I have a whole chapter on kind of my adventures in the field. I have an unusual career. If uh, you go back over here and you're going to follow these, some of these links about my profession, you'll find out I'm a law professor at Chapman University. School of Law. If you go here and you check out that stuff, you'll find out that. So that's kind of my day job. And then about half of the time, I now work on projects for clients. And um, in this special jurisdiction field, the book is all about special jurisdictions. I should maybe say that. It's all about this quiet revolution that's taking over the world, under which we are getting more choice in government. It might not feel that way to Friends of, of Liberty that things are getting better. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this year, but... The overall larger trend, which I don't think is going away, is pretty good for freedom. It really is. We're all getting more choice in government. That's what this book is all about. And the answer, by the way, to your next government is hopefully people, people want to know, well, what is my next government? And the book answers, hopefully, probably, it'll be a government that you choose to some degree more and more with each passing year. So, yay. It's basically an optimistic book backed by facts. I'm a rational optimist. Lots of facts. That's what all these figures, a lot of these figures are about. So just click on one of these figures. You can see, you know, there's a graph. There's a graph after graph after graph, uh, graph in this book. Okay, so about half the time I'm working on private projects. And so one of the chapters in the book is all about those adventures in the field. It's called Adventures of the Sort Ordinarily Recounted Over Drinks. And I talk about the work I've done in the field in French Polynesia in Honduras. Um, I've worked with, worked with people in Liberland uh, in between um, uh, what is it, Croatia and Serbia. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had some adventures. And in this update, I'm going to tell you about some things that happened since the book went to press because the audio book I finished in the spring, in May. And so I, I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Let's do it. Here's some stuff that happened in um, about two and a half years since your next government came out. This is Anaclia in the country of Georgia. You might not know where the country, the republic, let's see if I can pull it up quickly, the republic of Georgia, not the state. They're both great, but they're different, George. Uh, um, and these folks flew me there. Uh, it was the farthest into Asia that I've ever gone. So it was kind of Super cool. I had a great time. Loved Georgia. Will highly recommend it as a destination. And so it's this country right here. It's got a, a really interesting history. It's such an interesting place with a great culture, great people. 
and they want to build a free port right here where I have the cursor. I hope you can see this. And the people who are behind this basically invited me to come to their uh, capital. And I spoke before parliament and I did some stuff with the media. It was super fun. And I don't need to keep looking at this. Let's go back. And that's just a thing I did. Um, it was to help educate the people there, the politicians, the press, the, the uh, people in the public about what a special jurisdiction is. Specifically here, it's a free port. Why it could help their economy. That kind of thing. I'm a big fan of special jurisdictions. They can be done wrong or right, but I'm basically a fan of doing it right. And I see them here trying to do it right. That project has stalled out because of financing issues. It's the largest capital development project the Republic of Georgia has ever undertaken. So that's like a huge thing for their, their system to swallow. And they're kind of struggling with it. I think it's going to happen, but right now it's kind of like, oh, we had a falling out with the government. And we got to patch things up. So that's an Oclea. Some other stuff I did. This won't interest you quite as much. It's not, it doesn't sound as adventurous. <laughs> I didn't get to go anywhere cool, but I like it. It's called the Institute for Competitive Governance. It is an institution uh, that I, have, I didn't start, but I got brought into early, and I've helped build. I am the uh, academic director of the Institute for Competitive Government, uh, Governance. And notice our tagline here, a better way to better government. The whole idea is that by encouraging special jurisdictions, we can have more competition in government. More competition is essential. And that's what special jurisdictions are going to let us have. More competition in government, and we're going to make governments compete. And I say this because I used to work at the Cato Institute. If you go find my CV, you'll see I spent some time there working as a director of telecommunications and technology studies. I love the people at Cato, love their mission, their ideals, everything about it. Only good things to say, but their approach to reform which was my approach to reform, because I was there, is an inch deep and a, basically a countrywide. If you're talking about America, they'll say, we want to change the tax code you know, for all of America. That's really hard to pull off, as it turns out, <laughs> because America has a lot of people in it. And even if you're just going an inch deep, there's going to be a lot of people out there. It's the inch they don't want to give up. Okay? What special jurisdictions do is a whole new approach to government reform. You go narrow but deep. Narrow but deep. You pick out one place and you say, we're going to change the rules here. Because it's not the whole country. We don't get everybody upset. It's just one little area. And if it doesn't work out, we didn't have things up for everybody. It was a failed experiment. We all learned. But if it works, wow. So that's a thing I've been doing. And I also want to point out there is a journal I started with them. This is the first journal I've started. It is the Journal of Special Jurisdictions. We've had our first uh, issue come out. And indeed, in this, I have a paper, which I won't say much about here, but I'll just point out... Um, I've actually published two papers with them. <laughs> Here's the most recent, ULEX, an open source law for non-territorial governance. And this is about how ULEX, which I'll mention a bit more about in a second, could be really useful for non-territorial governments like uh, those online. And, but the thing I really wanted to show you was, oh, yes, we got to go to the archives. This journal's been around long enough, so there are archives. And in the first issue here, I had a paper that's I, – I thought it actually added something to this field. It was about – I'm not finding it. It's about special international zones. I wasn't planning on this, people. I'm going to move on. Move on. Here's the big news. Prospera, Honduras. Pros it's not Prospera. Please notice the accents at the beginning. Prospera. Prospera, Honduras is a ZEDE. A ZEDE is a special jurisdiction. It is, in this particular case, in Honduras. Now, this is a map here. This is Roatan which is an island. I've been there. It's beautiful. It's a tropical island, former pirate hideout, a refuge for castaways. The place has history out the gills, also beautiful coral reefs. And it's right off the coast of Honduras. Here's Honduras down here. It's off the northern coast of Honduras. Honduras is in that part of Central America that does this kind of dog leg turn. And the island is, um, it's interesting. I just heard this. There's a great new podcast out uh, by the Charter Cities Institute by my a longtime colleague in this area, Mark Lutter, and he interviewed Eric Bryman, who is the head. Let's see if we can find a picture here of Eric. He's the head of the um, development team behind Prospera. There he is, Eric, a longtime friend of mine, as is Gabe Delgado. Um, and me and these two guys and some of the other people on this team, um, oh, yeah, I'm seeing some familiar faces here. We've had a lot of adventures 
<laughs> in this field, by which I mean both Honduras, which is a wow place, and trying to develop special. So why am I excited about Prospera? It is the most advanced special jurisdiction in the world, and it just opened its doors in uh, the spring. I helped uh, with the legal system, basically. I helped, uh, I have some code in there. In fact, Ulex, which I'll say something about later, is at the heart of their legal system, the Roatan Common Law Code. They've created a new legal system for this special jurisdiction because Honduras gave them permission to do that. The ZA system in Honduras is, yes, it's a special jurisdiction on steroids. It's amazing. It's the most advanced program in the world. And you're thinking in Honduras, if you know anything about Honduras, you're probably a little skeptical. I get it. I, I got tons of facts in this book, my book right here, if you want to get it. Tons of facts about Honduras and how it's uh, got some problems. But that's why they have this very advanced program, because they realize to get foreign investment to our country, to create jobs here so our people can stay home and not try to slip across the border up in America just so they can find a living. To make that happen, we got to offer the world a lot. We can't just say, come to Honduras and we'll give you a 5% tax break. I mean, that's not enough. And so they wanted, they want to create a Hong Kong in Central America. And it turns out the land area, I was going to say this, and I got a little distracted. The land area of Rotan is almost exactly the same land area as Hong Kong. That's kind of interesting. Um, so they're trying to create a Hong Kong in Central America off the northern coast of Honduras on the island of Roatan. And it's not a good, well, it's a, a public-private partnership because you've got to do this with the government, but this is being run and financed by a private company. And the government did not say, go to Roatan and do this. The private developers had to find the site, do all the marketing. I've been to the site. Oh, my gosh, it's wonderful. It really is wonderful. I've been swimming in the waters where they're going to do this. And it's just like you step in the water, it's warm. I live here in California. It's not warm. And there it's warm, and you step in the water. And boom, you're looking at coral reef like right away. And they really take good care of the coral reef in road time too because they care. So, so anyhow, this is a very exciting project for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, if you like are a friend of humanity and you want to see better governance for so much of the world, which suffers under really terrible governments, this is super exciting. If you care about Honduras or Latin America, you want to see some development money going down there and not the kind of usual government dole, make everybody kind of sit on their rears and, you know, wreck their economies. This is a way for Hondurans to shine. It's going to give Hondurans a way to show the world what Hondurans can do, because we're going to give them the best legal system they've ever had. It's already been ranked. The, the freedom of doing business, they hired a consultant. They said, tell us how we do under their rankings. This isn't like an official ranking, but this consultant said, I'm using the objective criteria they use in the ease of doing business index. You guys are number nine in the world in Rotan. Wow. So super exciting. If you want to move there, you can. There's ways to do it. Go to the website. Check it out. Um, I think they built their first buildings. They're going to have, I should show you this picture. They're going to have these world, whoa, hello. These uh, world famous architects do the, uh, they're, they're, whoops, I scrolled. World famous architects doing the uh, architecture. Um and I can think, there it is. Yeah, Zaha Hadid Architects doing these wonderful, elegant, modern buildings using local materials. This in itself is going to be a huge burst, uh, a boost to their economy. Going to be great jobs coming out of this. Going to be a lot of uh, talk in the media about uh, Rotan and going to get people going there. All right. Now, I've been talking a little bit, like 15 minutes. I'm just going to take a breath now. We've got a few people here. I got more to cover, but I just don't like to talk too long. I know I get a little, uh, yeah, you can have too much of me easily. So I'll take a breath here. If you got questions, I'll be happy to hear them. I'll go back to my Zoom if you want to do chat and make sure that's going, if I can see it. No, I can't see it. Well, I'm not seeing the chat. And if you want, but if you want to unmute and ask, that's fine. If not, I'll keep going. Yeah. I'll keep going. I was curious. Uh, this is Ryan Lopez. Um, how, um, uh, how far along are they with this? And is there any trouble on the horizon that you can see from the Honduran government? Are they doing this with the Honduran government uh, uh, with their blessing? Or is this something that is causing any waves? Uh, well, um, short answer is it looks like they have a great relationship with the government. I mean, it's a short answer. 
And the administration has changed between the time they passed the legislation and they amended their constitution. Uh, the, you know, you could have easily said back when they got this going, it would have been like a 2014. Man, they want this to happen. Because they passed a law, it got shot down by their constitutional court as unconstitutional. They amended their constitution, passed a new law. And, you know, and then it's taken, but it's taken years. I've worked on three teams in this country on this project under two statutes. And it's these guys, the, the, the team here at, at Prospera, with whom I worked, but I mean, they, so many other people worked on it and did so much other stuff. I mean, I'm just proud to be associated with them, but they're the ones who took it through and have had to do it every step with the, work, with the help of the government. It is a private-public partnership. It's the fact they made it this far, and you're looking at this picture, and they have broken ground shows the Honduran government's okay with it. And I think the Honduran government is going to get more okay with it because they haven't really seen any money from it yet. But the money's going to come if this all goes as planned or close to as planned. So I think it's going to work out great. That said, we got to recognize it is Honduras. And I was going to say the way they do politics down there is a little different from the way they do it here in America, but now I can't say that. What I will say in both places, it seems, uh, going to the ballot box is not enough. People have to get out in the street and sometimes burn things. So there's no guarantees anywhere now, I guess. <laughs> That's why I think this is a growth industry. Because the nation states are failing and, uh, friends, it's going to get worse. I have a paper coming out about that. And this is a ray of bright light. And hopefully, who knows, Honduras could do a freak out thing like American politics is doing now. But I think there's a lot of hope. The incentives are good for their, for their political institutions to receive this as a good thing, maybe even their salvation. I'll go on unless we've got questions. Let's talk a little more about what I've been up to. Or we're, I hope I'm still sharing a screen. Let me know if I'm not. Um, so in the book, I talked about um, the first seasteaders, uh, basically. Let me see if I can pull this up. The first seasteaders. This is a, a – um, it's really a series of videos that my friend Joe Quirk uh, created for – the Seasteading Institute. As I relate in the book, I am a pro bono legal advisor to the, pro, to the Seasteading Institute, which is really what I want to show you, the Seasteading Institute. And um, they are the folks I went with to, is it seasteading.org? Jeez, it's not pulling it up. I'm going to skip that. Um, they're the folks I went to French Polynesia with. And then after the book came out, my friends Nadia and Chad here said, we're going to build a seastead in Thailand. We're going to do this. And that's my friends uh, there. And I think this is actually in Thailand. They went ahead and they, they just did it. There's their initial seastead. Now, the whole idea with seasteading is we're going to create autonomous communities on the open ocean. It was created by people who said we need more options in government and we can't do anything on the land because they're hogging everything. So we're going to build communities at sea. That's a really brave, interesting project. I've been happy to work with them, proud. We've done some great stuff. This was not a Seasteading Institute project. We knew what was going on and we were following it. We're very sympathetic, but they didn't ask us for legal advice. I want to emphasize that because in my book, I made very clear. I have a whole chapter on seasteading. And one of the things I make very clear is if you don't have a flag on your vessel in international waters, you will be frowned upon perhaps even boarded, arrested and have your vehicle, your vessel towed away. My friends, Chad and Nadia, you can go get the whole story here. This is the logo for the Seasteading Institute, and this is one of this is Seasteader, the first Seasteaders four. I won't click on it, but my friend Joe Quirk, president of the Seasteading Institute, has done this great video series. tells the story of Chad and Nadia, Chad and Nadia, and I give the update about it. But the short of it is, they went out there off of the coast of Thailand, and they put out their sea stead. And the Thai Navy, even though they were outside, outside of the territorial waters of Thailand, took offense. They got an inside um, tip and were able to escape just ahead of the Thai Navy. But the Thai Navy came 14, it was more than 14 nautical miles out they came because they, came, they went outside of their, they went thir their, their territorial waters of Thailand, like most countries, only go 12 nautical miles out. And they put that sea pod, they were very careful, and they documented it, 13 nautical miles out. But the Thai Navy still didn't like it. They'd heard some talk about these seasteaders wanting to do their own, like, countries. They didn't like that at all. 
They went out there, guns drawn. They, they towed away. They were ready to arrest Chad and Nadia, Chad and Nadia, who fled in the dark. They actually had to take evasive action to get away from the Thai Navy. They had to go through a series of countries to find a safe shelter because many countries in the region were quite ready to extradite because there were charges of treason against these first seasteaders. The Thai Navy said they are trying to create, like they're trying to overthrow the Thai government. It was wrong. It was a lie or some kind of misunderstanding. But anyhow, my friends had to flee. Their initial attempt at sea setting was a disaster. They almost got arrested. Their sea uh, stead was towed away and destroyed. You can see all this in the video series. Sounds bad, and it was bad, but there's a happy ending because they fled to Panama. Now, their problems were in the spring of 20... Um, yeah, this happened so recently, 2019. By the summer of 2019, they had made it to Panama. They had some friends there, some people who were interested in seasteading. Now, Panama is a really interesting place, and now I've been there because later the summer, later that summer, I went to Panama too. Me and Joe Quirk, this was a TSI mission, just like they took me to French Polynesia to negotiate with government there. Ultimately, unsuccessfully, but it was a good experience, all told. We learned a lot. And so TSI, the Seasetting Institute, said, Tom, come down to Panama. We got some more government people to talk to, investors, local people. Let's just try to help this happen. We're not investors. We're not like running the show, but it's what TSI does. They kind of like help, <laughs> right? That's what they do. They help. They try to. So we go down there and we like talk to government people. And I, a lot of my work is trying to figure out the law so I can, you know, we can, a lot of wrinkles. So that's what I work on. And this is the company they built, Ocean Builders. And they are now building these in Panama on the northern coast in Linton Bay. You can look it up. Um, I should have put up some maps here. This is a picture, I think, of, yeah, Linton Bay. This was one of the times they um, put out their test rig. I've been in the waters there, and they're quite nice. Let's see what other photos they have. The waters there are very nice. Yep, this is some of the stuff they're building. And um, they've gotten involved in the community. There's a whole kind of aquatic industry hotbed starting up now. Um, it's not just them. One of the world's largest ocean um, fish farms, I guess I could call it, mariculture facilities, is nearby. It's uh, called um, Ocean Blue, I think it's called. Is it Ocean? Ocean Blue. And they grow cobia in huge underwater cages. And so that's another kind of, you know, inter, uh, uh, um, aquatic thing they're doing in Panama. So I'm really excited about this. The legal side of it, I'm not as excited about. I don't want to get into that right now. I'll just say, yay, seasteaders, we're making progress. We found a safe home. They're not <laughs> trying to kill us. We're friendly with the government. And now we're trying to get like a good zone there so they can not only have the hardware, but the software. I'll say a few more and then we'll go back to questions. A few more things. So I talked in the book about Ulex. Ulex is the open source legal operating system that is a picture of the plant ulex which by happy coincidence is a you know got the same name as ulex but uh, it's a cute thing and here is ulex you can actually look at it there it is it's a thing i put together for my clients i actually put it together when i was working in honduras and down in honduras the law enabling the za says basically we want you to create <laughs> they actually call it an Anglo-Saxon legal system. But they mean, you know, bring some common law to Latin America. Because remember, they want to create Hong Kong. So they say, well, what's, the thing, what's a thing about Hong Kong? It's not the only thing, but a thing about Hong Kong is they have the common law there. Maybe that's part of the secret sauce. I think there's something to that, too. So that's what they decided. So their law said, you know, bring some of the secret sauce. Bring the common law to this formerly civil law country. There's a big distinction in legal systems internationally between common law countries such as England and the many countries that it has uh, created, sometimes by <laughs> invading other countries, but whatever. That's the way England rolls. And it's gotten the common law in a lot of places, America, New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, there's other places. Or the civil law system, which is prevailing on the mainland in Europe, 
maybe I can now just say Europe and we don't include uh, the United Kingdom, but whatever. That's in France, Germany, and now also thanks to those countries and places like China, all throughout Africa, because those European countries had colonies too. And a lot of modern countries, some of the a few maybe, golly, I have to think about this. Actually, not many places until super recently have said, hey, we're going to opt into the common law because we just, you know, we like it. Usually they've had common law because that's their history. The English were once here shooting at us and now we have the common law. Civil law has actually been adopted in a few countries just because, hey, we're a new country here. We need a bunch of rules because the nice thing about the civil law is it's all written down. It's all in the form you're looking at now. This looks like the civil law. The civil law is a bunch of rules, and they're neatly numbered and labeled and organized. See, right? That's what I did. Procedural rules, 1.1. Procedural principles, 1.2. Default procedural rules. We get down in here. We got tort law, and look, there's some several sections. Property law, several sections. Contract law, I kept it simple. I'm a big fan of contract law. This is really all you need. So anyhow, what I did with Ulex, I had this client in South America, Latin America, Honduras, and it says, hey, we need common law. These people don't know what the common law is. None of us really do. Really, to have the common law, you got to read a bunch of cases. Strictly speaking, the common law is what a bunch of courts say over a long period of time, and you got to read a ton of cases to figure it out. And there's no way to do a legal system that way from scratch. Totally inefficient. Never will work. But this will work. This will work because what I did, let's just look at common law. we got to have common law, contract law. Well, the American Law Institute actually created this restatement of contracts. They had a bunch of learned judges and lawyers and law professors sit down and work out the rules of contract law. They read the cases, and then they boil it down in this nice, neat, organized way that looks like the civil law. And that's what I did. I took my little basket in the library. I collected all these bodies of law. It goes on a bit, but not super long. And if you follow through all these links, you will have basically everything you need for the core of the legal system. That is ULEX, and it's now running at the core of Prosperous. So that's cool. I'm super happy about that. There's a place now I can point to on the map and say ULEX is running inside. It's like, you know, uh, Intel used to have these things. Intel, is that what it was? Intel inside. Well, you can say like ULEX is inside. And I've got some other jurisdictions I want to run it in. I'll tell you, the last thing I'll tell you about it. This is a project I've been working on. Free Society Project, this website's super out of date. Uh, I got to talk to them about that. Um, we're busy building instead of fooling around with the website. And basically, this is what I've been working on a lot. The idea is to create a system of governance which can be completely distributed, in which there will be no city hall or national capital, no parliament, not even sitting judges. Everything is distributed. It is well, I'll say, regulated in the generic sense in that there are rules and everything is orderly, in fact, very orderly, but that does not mean it is not free. It is structured, but like a tinker toy set or a Lego set. Every piece is solid and it connects nicely to other parts and with it you can build wonderful things. That is the goal. That's what I've been working on. I'm very excited about this. You're excited when people find out about this. What they're excited about is, oh, super cool. You're going to go find like some country that needs money and has some, ape, has some empty land and you're going to like just give them the money and create a country? And if they say that to me, I go, no, it's not really how it works. Yeah, no. Nah. But I got to admit it looks like that. <laughs> you know, People walk into a room, one party has sovereignty over, over territory, and the other party has a big checkbook and a plan, and then when they walk out, there's two countries. Two countries leave the room. That's what it'll look like if we pull it off. And you want to know, where's it going to happen? And of course, I'm not going to say anything about that. I'll say what's exciting for me is building the legal system. Actually, this is not just the legal system. ULEX is just a part of this. This is the whole kit and caboodle. This is everything you need, nuts to soup. Oops, that's not how it goes. Soup to nuts. <laughs> Forward or backwards. Everything you need, soup to nuts, is what we want to be able to offer the world, um, together with the territory. If you don't have the territory on which to run the software, you got to have the hardware and the software, it's just a cool thing that you can dream about. So it's basically my lifestyle. But if you got the hardware, you can actually run it. And I'm trying to design the system so you can, 
you know, if this particular project doesn't work out, you can run the same system on a sea instead. You can run the same system in Antarctica if you want to go down there. There's some parts of Antarctica that aren't claimed. Um, you get the point. The point is it's supposed to be like this kind of um, operating system that you can run um, wherever you want. So I'm going to stop there. That is what I've been up to in the last uh, two and a half years since my book, Your Next Government, came out. I'm holding this up. and You can maybe see it. Um, and I'll take questions if you have. Hey, Tom. Uh, it's Ryan again. I was curious. Uh, uh, I want to get more information on that ULEX, uh, uh, you know, kind of constitution in the box. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, it, it's a fantastic idea. Now, I know what open source means, generally speaking. How do you... Uh, how do you define it, and, and, and what's your intention on how to make that particular thing open source? It's open source in the sense um, that it's available on GitHub, so at least it's got that, but it's more than that. It basically means if you want to run Ulex, it's all right there. You can download it. And here I get to a caveat. This is a little complicated, but this is why we have questions. We can get into the details. It turns out it's a little complicated. I talk about this in the book. It's not in the audio book, uh, in the new part, because, you know, it's in the original book. Okay, so here's the problem. Although ULEX itself is not copyright restricted, some people would say copyright protected. I'm a little skeptical of copyright, so I say it's copyright restricted. ULEX is not. Some of the constituent rule sets are. In fact, the very one we were looking at, the restatement second of contracts, the American Law Institute, which is a, a tax exempt organization here in America, it's non governmental, it's private, but it's charitable. And they're the people that get together the learned judges and the law professors and the hotshot lawyers, all the top dogs in the law field, and say, please, learned people, tell us what you think the contract law is. And these people contribute a lot of work. It's like heroic work. I really admire what they do. Obviously, I admire what they do, I love what they've done. But then they claim a copyright in it. And for reasons I talk about in my book here where I go through, and I've also written a book about copyright. I dare say I know a little bit about this subject. And I apply copyright law to the claim of the ALI, the ALI claiming we have a copyright in the rules we discovered when we read these public documents. That's what they claim they have a copyright in. And I'm not going to say their claim is completely ridiculous. It is not. It definitely would get them into court. And, you know, what can I say? There's even a chance they might win, but they shouldn't. They should not be able to claim a copyright in those rules. There's actually a specific provision in the Copyright Act, United States Federal Copyright Act, that says you cannot copyright a system, a method of operation, an organization. That is not like a novel or a song it's not your heart singing to the world. It's not an expressive work. No copyright. And that's exactly what the ALI has produced with their restatement second of contracts. It's a set of flipping rules. It's outside of the scope of copyright. But here's the thing, Ryan. They claim a copyright. Do I want to go kick that hornet's nest? It's the American Law Institute. Okay? <laughs> they are all lawyers. And I've actually talked with them. I, it's a long story because I tried to get a license from them. I was not the guy to do it because, you know, I basically wrote to them and said, hey, you don't really have a copyright, but what are you going to make me do here? <laughs> you know, because I was just had a terrible attitude. Somebody else took over the negotiations and it worked out great. Um, and Prospera has a license. Last I checked, this is, I haven't looked into this lately, but I believe they do have, and this lets them make all the rules. See, ULEX says, here's the structure, and now to really know your contract law, you got to kind of open that box. you got to go to that, that book on the shelf and take it down and open it up. The rules are inside. And I have a copy of uh, the restatement of, of contracts right here on my desktop because I teach contracts. And so, you know, you can open it up and look inside the book, and I'll just show you what it would look like. These are actually restatement rules, okay? And you would find a bunch of rules. 
ALI claims a copyright, so that is a hindrance to ULEX. How is ULEX going to be available for the Free Society Project or for people who want to do something on a seastead? This is something that is a problem. It, there are solutions, but it is complicated. Hopefully, they don't involve litigation in U.S. courts with the American Law Institute. Even if it did result in kicking them to the curb and saying, you greedy hogs, how dare you? Uh, that would be awesome, except it would be expensive and take a long time, and I don't want to kick that horn's nest. That's kind of a long answer, Ryan. Complicated. Copyright and ULEX, complicated. I believe someday it will not be a problem, but for now it's uh, something i got to deal with. I always thought that law was 90% copy anyway. 90%. <laughs> 90%. Now you're going to copy it out of a book anyway. And just, oh, that's true. You know, that's a funny thing. You're absolutely right because the culture of law, this is another reason why it's kind of offensive what the ALI is doing because the culture of law is actually kind of chill. It'll shock you to hear this. But among lawyers, it's, it's kind of accepted that if somebody does a really good complaint, suppose, you know, they're in California and it was a, you know, a particular kind of complaint, like an asbestos claim. And somebody files this, complaint and it's a really great complaint and it wins and you're the next the plaintiff over <laughs> it's a court filing it's public you go look at that complaint and you basically copy it and the other attorney they're very it has happened there's been a few cases where attorney an, an attorney has said hey that's my expressive work i made these arguments i was creative it's actually not a bad argument which is all the more remarkable <laughs> makes it all the more remarkable that's so seldom do attorneys care they they don't I don't, they don't fuss over that. I think it's because they realize they're smart people, right? I'm not every attorney, but you know, most attorneys are not, they're not stupid. They can be wicked, but not stupid, most of them. And I think they realize we need this culture. Because otherwise, I got to do all my own work. And damn, if I want to do my own work. So let's just keep this going. And also, they, excuse me, they're, they're a little cocky. If you're an attorney and you won the case, and somebody else is coming and eating off your plate, you know, it's because you know how to cook. And that's cool. And then winning probably doesn't take any business away from you. Most attorneys, you know, they're not going to be able to take up every case. So they're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you go ahead and admire me, make money, because I'm awesome. I think that's the way most attorneys view it. I don't know, but there's not a lot of suing going on, and I think it's a good thing. All right, last question for me, Tom. When are you going to uh, move to one of these special uh, governmental zones? <laughs> I've given it a lot of thought. My son, I live in San Clemente, California, which is a lovely place to live. I love it here. But my son's in his last year of high school, and he's really, I won't say he's what's keeping me here, but I'm not going to leave while he's around doing that. But pretty soon he'll be off at of college, and I won't have to hang out here. And then let the world know, you know, I could think hard and long and maybe end up saying yes at the end of. <laughs> I could think about going to another country and working on a zone there or more generally working on a set of projects. I mean, I'm already like half time working on projects like this. These days, of course, I do it often at home. But um, yeah, um, maybe I could end up like helping not only set up, but help manage a legal system in a paradise somewhere where they have um, good surf and um, maybe yoga classes. I'm not super picky, but there's some things I wanna have. So I'll think about it. If, you, if you've got an opportunity, you know where to find me. All right, Tom. I really appreciate everything. Uh, unless somebody else has a question for, for you, then I think we, we can wrap it up. Okay. Great. Very informative. And get the book. Get the book. Get the book. And if you want to find out more, go to TomWBell.com, and there's a link for the book, Your Next Government, and you can buy it and listen to it or read it or both. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks, much. Tom. Very, Bye. very, very interesting. Thank you. I'll see you friends later. Take care, Tom.